Welcome to Battleground Politics. I'm Lauren Mate. In early October, I sat down with David O, the Republican nominee for mayor in Philadelphia. It is a city where Republicans are at a disadvantage right from the start because registered Democrats outnumber registered Republicans by almost seven to one. We talked about his campaign, about the future of his party, both in Philadelphia and nationally. We talked about choosing a new police commissioner and he addressed some questions about how he's described his military service. David O, thank you so much for taking some time. Good to see you. Great seeing you. Thanks for inviting me here. Let's talk about the race that you are in for mayor of Philadelphia. When we talked back in May, you said you had, you had done the counting, you'd counted the votes, you knew what you needed. You said you thought you had what you needed, you just had to go and get them. Yes. Um, and secure those votes. Do you, at this point in the race, feel like you've done that? Yeah, I do. And um, it was a very difficult task. You know, uh, it was um, a very narrow path, uh, but it was there. Uh, a lot of things had to fall into place in, in order to arrive where we've arrived at. And um, yeah, th things have worked out better than I expected. So tell me where you're getting these votes. You know the numbers uh, as well as anyone in terms of the disadvantage that, that Republicans yes. have running citywide. Uh, where are you getting the votes? So I'm, I'm basically getting them from Democrats who are unhappy with the city. They uh, have been unhappy for a long time, but what's really driving them is public safety. There's a lot of uh, uh, people, and, and the, the majority of them are Democrats, who vote in um, the municipal election for mayor, uh, about 300,000 people altogether. And so they are very much uh, wrestling with the fact that they want change, they want public safety, and they feel that the policies of the last eight years have been uh, failures. Uh, and, and, and you can hear them in social media. Like things that are being done now, such as uh, uh, confiscating ATVs and dirt bikes, should have been done a long time ago. And um, uh, not arresting people for, for retail theft, which has closed many businesses and driven uh, convenience stores out of, out of neighborhoods, especially those where people get their uh, prescription medication and over-the-counter medication. Um, is very problematic. It has created a, a culture of lawlessness where we now have suburban uh, people coming into our city to commit crimes for the fun of it. I, I do have to um, just point out one thing mm -hmm. because sure. uh, District Attorney Larry Krasner was asked specifically about retail theft recently and he said that they do um, charge for retail theft. They do prosecute for retail theft. It may end up being a summary offense or a misdemeanor, but he says that they do. Well, that's the problem. What he says and what he does is two different things. And, and we have a reputation and people out in the community and the police officers and the store owners know that we don't. That is why people go in and load up in various stores and walk out. Uh, and it's also the police that are not arresting them. So that is a problem of leadership telling our law enforcement not to enforce the law depending on whatever the whims are of our elected officials. This city certainly did see a situation with looting recently, and I wanted to ask you about that because uh, as mayor, you, you do only have um, jurisdiction over certain things, uh, but what specifically would you do to make sure that that does not happen in the future? Sure, the, f the first thing is that- we Within your jurisdiction. Within my jurisdiction, which is ver uh, quite a bit. I mean, we're a strong mayor city. The fact that our mayor doesn't exercise the power, um, that has a lot to do with a lot of things, but it has nothing to do with me. In other words, I'm enforcing the law. What happens is we can anticipate that after a peaceful demonstration, there is a very specific group of people that like to piggyback off of that to um, vandalize loot in the name of justice. And, and what they think is, and why they think it, is because it has been communicated to them that if you loot and vandalize, if you break windows and steal things right after a peaceful uh, protest, that you will be treated very leniently. And in fact, that is true. And so I think the important message uh, to send to them is that will no longer be tolerated. First of all, you're, you're, you're disrespecting the peaceful protest, the constitutional right that people have to express themselves by having this uh, looting and, and, and vandalism, which sometimes turns into violent crimes as well. And, and so that message has to come out there. So what I would have done as mayor 
is I would have anticipated it, put out a show of force of police officers and vehicles, drones, which is, I, which is what I will use, to line the areas where we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen in Center City, it's going to happen in West Philadelphia, and it's going to happen in the Lower Northeast. And that's where it has happened continuously. You and I have talked about um, the, uh, a new police commissioner yes. before, uh, but that was prior to the resignation of Danielle Outlaw. Yes. And I know that you said you had someone in mind, and so now that there has been a resignation, um, what, have you taken any steps to um, meet with people, to um, offer anything to, to, to someone? I know you're not in the, in the job, but have you taken any steps since her resignation uh, on a potential new police commissioner? So I have a very specific person in mind that I have full confidence in. Uh, I did speak to that person um, just to say that if I were to win the election and I gave you a call, about being police commissioner of Philadelphia, would you take that call? And the answer was yes. And, and, and that's as far as we've gone. Is that person in Philadelphia right now? No. Has that person worked in Philadelphia? Yes. Um, could you tell me who it is? No, Why because not? that person has a job. And, and, and I would need their permission uh, to talk about them because as soon as the name is mentioned, it goes into the press and where they are working, they become very concerned about whether that person's going to stay or leave. So there, there is a current um, interim or acting yes. commissioner right now, John Stanford. Mm -hmm. Would you consider keeping him on? I would consider. Um, you know, the thing is that, as I said, um, I've spoken to a person um, and that person has indicated that they would be responsive, uh, um, but I don't know how that conversation is going to go. But that conversation will happen on November 8th, and then I'll know, uh, because it won't take long to figure out if they're going to come here or not. Another thing that has happened recently in the realm of public safety was the shooting of uh, Eddie Irizarry um, by police. Um, and I wanted to ask you your thoughts of what's transpired since then, because the charges against the officer have been dismissed. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I wasn't in the courtroom, uh, and I haven't read the transcript. I did see the video. The video is very disturbing from what I've seen, but I haven't seen all angles. And from what I understand, um, what happened in the courtroom, and I wasn't there, is that the district attorney had to present the case, prima facie case, which is not, not a very heavy burden, that a crime occurred. That, that's the issue. Did the crime occur? Because we all saw the shooting. And, and there's a lot of issues around there. Um, the judge dismissed the case, I believe, because it was unclear that that shooting was a crime. However, the district attorney can rearrest because um, the, uh, the defendant was not sworn in to testify, so double jeopardy has not attached. That means simply you could refile the case. However, the district attorney has filed an appeal, and that is the district attorney's choice in doing that. But the, this case is, is far from over. It's simply a first step in what will eventually be uh, a, a process that is most likely to go to a jury trial. I think one of the problems that I see is that we have three different branches of government. Uh, what I see as a citizen and as a mayoral candidate is um, a shooting that I think should not have happened. But my first question is, who trained this officer? What happened there? And, and um, I introduced a, a resolution on minimum force training, which I am a very strong supporter of, and it was defeated. So, regardless of what transpires mm -hmm. specifically yes. with that case and how that plays out, yeah. whoever the next mayor is, whoever the next police commissioner is, is going to have to rebuild some trust yes. with the community. Yes. Um, how do you do that? Well, uh, what happens is you have to be very clear about what your role is as mayor, what the role of the police, uh, what, the, what their role is, and I'm very much uh, 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 an advocate of community policing, which really begins with this. The attitude of the uh, police department is one of service. It is um, the duty of officers to protect the rights of every citizen in our city and every visitor, constitutional rights, civil rights. Um, that is why I think it is critical that we do not uh, uh, employ stop-and-frisk tactics, 
particularly in neighborhoods that have a bad relationship with our police officers, because when our police arrive, we need 1,300 new police officers. And when they arrive in communities that have not been policed, that have not had the uh, adequate policing that they need in center city, in our tourist areas, in our subway system, in our schools, and every other place, that should not be anything but good news. And so when the police arrive, so does street cleaning. So does cleaning up uh, the neighborhood. So does uh, taking care of vacant lots. Uh, all of these things arrive with the police. We, we take care of, because uh, now they can enforce the anti-dumping laws and, and, and removal of uh, illegal tractor trailers um, parked in front of people's homes that, that are not supposed to be there. So when the police arrive, good things happen, and that's what we want to reinforce. But if police violate people's rights, if, if we send out the police to have conflict and friction, uh, which is completely our fault for instructing the police to, to violate people's civil rights, then you can't have community policing because community policing and public safety is a marriage between the community, which are the residents and, and the businesses and everyone else, with the police who are there to protect them and serve them. Before we move on from, yeah. from the issue mm -hmm. of, um, of gun violence and, and yeah. crime, uh, on sort of an administrative level, I wanted mm -hmm. to see what your plans were regarding some lawsuits that the city has filed um, in an effort to address gun violence against uh, ghost gun manufacturers um, and gun shops. What would be your plan as mayor? Would you continue those lawsuits? Yeah, ghost guns, absolutely. And, um, you know, the problem with a lot of these um, uh, um, do-it-yourself gun kits, they don't have uh, serial numbers on them, and there's no reason why they shouldn't. We should track who is... Um, purchasing these guns, who is responsible for them, and where they turn up. And so, yeah, I, I will uh, continue um, that plus advocacy, you know, for state laws and federal laws about um, these, uh, these ghost guns. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about the possibility of a new 76ers arena uh, and where things stand on there, stand in that. It, it appears that this will be on the plate of the next of the next administration, the way the timing is looking now. Um, I recently talked to uh, your Democratic counterpart in yes. this race, Sherelle Parker, and I asked her who she has met with on this. I'll ask you the same thing. Who have you met with? regarding uh, a possible 76ers arena? Well, initially I met with the 76ers rep representatives uh, in connecting them to the residents, businesses, and um, organizations that are in Chinatown. And I made it clear, I'm an at-large council person, but I don't live in Chinatown. So this was previously? Uh, yeah, previously. Like, Before you were like, a candidate for mayor? Um, I think so. I can't, I can't really remember. You know, time has gone by so quickly, but... You know, I did put them together, and I asked um, if the residents and, and, and organizations would like to meet with Comcast as well. Um, and uh, they wanted to, but they kind of, they went in their own direction. The issue for me, and I, I've so met as, with... So as a mayoral, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, as a mayoral candidate, which parties have you met with? As a mayoral candidate, I've met with, I believe, the uh, Sixers representatives and uh, Comcast Spectacor. Okay. And what about the community as well? I've met them previously, and I do hear from them. Okay. Um, so my opinion is that unless I see something in writing, I don't know what we're talking about. And we haven't seen anything in writing. I've seen graphic illustrations that seem to change anytime some new idea comes along, which is not anything that I could depend on. In other words, I need to see architectural designs. I'd have to see uh, parking studies, traffic studies, and things like that. Generally, uh, that is a bad location, generally. It's not built for a stadium type area. It, we have like a Jefferson Hospital over there, the university. We have a community called Chinatown. We have other communities. That is really more suited for um, venues that allow people to walk around, purchase, uh, go to restaurants, things like that. And, and Chinatown is 152 years in the making. The, the arena is not in Chinatown. It's adjacent to Chinatown. But the level of congestion, uh, parking problems, displacing of businesses, raising the property assessments and the taxes, which would be very harmful to those businesses, um, is substantial. And so I think the onus is on the Sixers to show that that is a viable place which will be a benefit to the region, benefit to the city, benefit to that area, and they have not done that. So you're not convinced it should go forward? 
Uh, I have seen nothing to prove it should go forward. Are you convinced it should not go forward? Um, I'm, I'm more on the side that unless they, they have the burn of proof. They've announced this project way early without any evidence that it's even viable or what it is. And they've done it in a very um, uh, uh, negative way. They've pitted communi communities against each other. And we've all, all, all watched that. And so it's very divisive, it's very problematic. And, and I think it's really what I would say is I'm not for the arena until they put something in paper for everyone to see. They should be very transparent about that process. Uh, on the ballot with you yep. this November will be city council members uh, or city ca candidates for city council, including some, uh, a bunch of them vying for your old at-large seat. Um, there is a, the way things work in Philadelphia, as you know, there's two seats that are set aside for the non-majority party, which right. traditionally has been Republicans. A, a working families party candidate did win one of those seats. Now they're trying to win two. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think Republicans will be able to hold on to at least one of those seats? I don't know. Um, and I'll just say that uh, I have endorsed uh, two Republicans, uh, Drew Murray and Jim Hasher. Um, uh, but, you know, it's up to the people, and I'm really focused on, on being the executive. It's a lot different when you're running for um, being a legislator, a council member. You're mostly dealing with um, introducing bills, voting for bills, doing the budget, and whatever initiatives you can do, and you're part of a group of people. You've got to somewhat decide where you fit in without, with 17 people. As mayor, you're an executive. You make decisions uh, pretty much um, It's a strong mayor city, and so uh, I'm very focused on what I'm doing, and uh, what I see uh, is um, the battle between uh, Working Families Party and, and the Republican uh, candidates for city council at large. Um, and I really couldn't tell you, you know, like, who's going to win or not. If you had continued to run for that at-large seat, do you think you would have been able to hold on? Yeah, to yeah, I would have held on to it. And I, I don't just say that, you know, th there's polling that shows that... Um, you know, you can't you can't 100 percent rely on polling, but very good polling um, indicates that um, I would uh, hold that seat pretty easily. If if the Working Families Party do, do take both of those seats and there is no Republican at large, yes, um, there could still be a Republican, obviously, uh, on the council, just not yes. an, just not an at yes. large one. Um, what do you think that means if that happens? Well, um, what likely what what it likely means is that our city council is going to swing to the left uh, because a few members can certainly influence the the rest of council, depending on whether council thinks uh, they are popular and whether you know they have kind of like um, uh, the momentum behind them. Uh, what I worry about is uh, the fact that our city is in a, a bad financial uh, situation right now and getting worse. Um, we have lost a lot of residents, a lot of um, uh, workers who are not coming back into the city, a lot of tourists, and it's mainly because of crime. But we have overtaxed our, our most vulnerable uh, residents. They are losing their homes. The taxes are, uh, as I've said many times, in my opinion, uh, illegal. They're improper. The methodology was found to be below industry standard, and I have fought against it. The taxes should always be accurate and fair. Let's stay on the issue of politics uh, mm -hmm. yep. for now. You. You have been in politics in Philadelphia for quite a while. Yes. Uh, quite a few years. Um, and in this particular race, an issue from uh, pre a previous election yes. resurfaced. And it has to do with your military record. Yes. I want to ask you about sure. it. Um, in 2011, you, you apologized in an ad for, quote, any confusion or mis impression I created is what you said uh, that suggests that you served as a special forces Green Beret or special forces officer. You said, I did not serve in such a capacity. But then you were quoted this year saying that you did serve in the Green Berets. What is the truth? Okay. Can I go get some paperwork? I just happen to have it. I think we could edit it in. Sure. You can go get some paperwork. Yep. Go ahead. All right. That'll, because it, it comes up, and I know it's a hard issue to, um, to explain. So I think it is just best, like it's kind of interesting. I had this paperwork yesterday and kind of ha came in handy. Go 
ahead, we're still rolling. Right, so I'm gonna start with the first question. Uh, there are articles written uh, every time I run since 2011 that said I did not serve in the Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. Uh, and that has resurfaced uh, this year. Um, and I've said I have served in the Special Forces, which is the Green Berets. So we'll start with did I serve or did I not, did well, I not serve? What you're saying, though, contradicts what you no, it doesn't. Wrote previously. No, it does not. So you did not. Ha you did not say I did not serve in such a capacity. I served in the U.S. Army Special Forces. I served in the Green Berets. Uh, the issue is, did I claim myself to be Special Forces qualified? I have never claimed that. And so the confusion arises: if you serve in a Green Beret unit, are you a Green Beret? If you wear a Green Beret, are you a Green Beret? Well, the terminology when I served was different because every soldier in Special Forces, the Green Berets, wore a Green Beret. So obviously we did not distinguish each other with the term Green Beret. We distinguished by Special Forces tab, tabbed, or Special Forces qualified, qualified, Q course qualified. This is a language that occurs, when, but when the uniform changed in 93, which I was not aware of, the terminology changed. So in 2011, I'm still using the terminology of uh, 1989, 1990, and 1991. So there's a two-part question there. Did you serve in the Green Berets? Absolutely. Uh, were you a SF qualified Green Beret when you served in the Green Berets? No, I wasn't. So you don't have to be uh, a, quote, Green Beret to serve in the Green Berets. Why has this been such a confusing subject. Why was there an apology in, in well, years ago? Sure. The issue uh, years ago is that if I did not know that there was a change in uniform uh, such that uh, a non-qualified um, special forces officer uh, would no longer be referred to as a untabbed Green Beret or a uh, uh, Green Beret who is not uh, SF qualified, uh, then when people refer to um, David O served in the Green Berets, David O was a Green Beret, usually the, the, the clarification is, but I was not SF qualified at the time. Um, but when you see a bunch of soldiers in a Green Beret unit, uh, because the, the, the clarification is Special Forces tab, but what is coming out at that time and years afterward is David O did not serve in the Special Forces, did not serve in the Green Berets. Uh, so I certainly did, and when the newspaper or whomever else says I didn't, that is completely untrue. I'm asking you about your words now versus your words then, though. My words now, my words then are absolutely the same. There are three things that our Green Beret is. One, it's a hat. So, so it is a hat. Um, the second thing it is, is it is a unit. Um, the people who wear the hat belong to a unit. And the third thing that it is, it represents a qualification. So it depends on which one you're saying. And so trying to um, take my words and, and, and say that David O. claimed to be a Special Forces qualified officer, I never did that. What I said is I served in the Special Forces, and that's absolutely true. And I also... Uh, as most veterans and Special Forces uh, soldiers here understand, is that I, I always um, state that I was not SF qualified, which in these stories, um, they try to make it as though uh, if you weren't Special Forces qualified, you weren't a member of the unit. But that is their uh, inability to understand the military unit. What is the um, paperwork that you wanted to um, show us? And I can take a picture of this so that we can show yeah, that you, you could. specifically. Uh, is there something specific that you want yeah, to see? Yeah, you, you could look at what it says. It has a unit. In other words, when you serve in the military, you serve in a unit. So if, if uh, as, the, as the stories continually say, I did not serve in the unit. Is this some, what, what specifically am I supposed to be looking at here? You look at the top. The top? Uh, there's a unit there. It says C Company, 1st Battalion, yes. 20th Spe Special Forces Group. 20th SFGA Special Forces Group Airborne. Okay. That's what it, that's, that's that's where, where I that's served. That's what you're referring to. Right. Okay. So it, 
if the uh, author of these articles has that paperwork and continually writes that I did not serve I'll in the unit, back. I'll take a picture. yeah, did not serve in the unit, that would be untrue. Uh, do you think you have been completely straight with people? Oh, absolutely. The years on this? Sure, absolutely. You know, uh, it is the confusion of the uh, articles. Uh, I never said that I am a SF qualified special forces officer. I never said that I am a Green Beret in the sense of being SF qualified or tabbed. Uh, I've always been clear about that. What they say is when I say I served in a Green Beret unit or a special forces unit, that I'm not telling the truth because I served in a National Guard unit and, and it was not a special forces unit. Well, it was a special forces unit and that's just uh, something that they do know because they have the paperwork. I may um, stay in the political realm uh, and ask mm -hmm. you something else. Uh, we had talked before about um, how there is a Republican primary yep. coming up. Uh, you said at the time you weren't sure who you were going with. Since then, there have been two Republican primary debates. I've not watched them. You have not watched either one? Yeah. It's That's your party. Yeah, it, well, it's, uh, it's my party, and um, I will choose among all the candidates when the time comes. Who are you leaning toward now? Uh, I'm not leaning towards anybody. You uh, previously told me, and you, you clarified this after we had talked, that you did vote for former President Trump in 2020. Yes. Uh, but not in 2016. Yes. Would you, are you open to voting for former President Trump in 2024? You know, it depends. What it does depends. It depend on? Depends on um, what the issues are, who the candidates are. Um, if it's what Trump and Biden. Well, you know, um, I vote for whomever I think is best for the country, and that will happen in November of next year. Are you open to voting for either one? I'm, I'm open to voting for anybody at this point in time. Uh, I'm not discounting anyone. Um, you know, and we haven't, we haven't really even started this process yet. Well, the process has started. It's... No, not for me. I mean, basically, we will end up with a winner of the Democratic primary. We'll end up with a winner of the Republican primary, and then we'll have two candidates, and they'll address the issues as we move towards November and as the, the nation's issues um, come up front. Uh, the issues, I think, will be clarified, like right now, the issues are changing. So at this point, is anyone off the table for you? Is, is President Biden off the table for you? Is former President Trump off the table for you? Nobody's off the table. Okay. And uh, again, I mean, we have new, new candidates running. Do you have any concerns running? about how, how President Trump uh, handled the 2020 election? Well, I have, I have concerns about uh, President Trump, whether or not um, he would do a good job, whether or not he's the best for the country at this point in time. Uh, I have concerns about how he's handled his job. Uh, but, you know, you get, you get to choose between uh, a number of different candidates. Um, and, uh, do you have concerns about how he handled January 6th? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I have issues about how President Biden has handled things, too. So I have issues about uh, the good and the bad of both of them, and I have issues about some of the candidates that have never held office before. Um, but, but, you know, I think um, uh, we should give them a chance. We should hear them out. But I'll be honest with you, like, I'm really not uh, giving anyone much consideration because I'm running for mayor of Philadelphia. And the president of the United States, whoever that is, is not going to deal with our schools directly or indirectly. They would deal with you, though. They well, they might, deal they might or might not deal with me as, as a mayor of Philadelphia, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one who fills the potholes. They're not going to do that. All right, we'll have to leave it there for now. David yeah. O., thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, I will. Um, yeah, I will. Um, Yeah, I will, I will make this statement because I think it's important. Um, I served in the 20th uh, Special Forces Group, uh, and I was activated for the Gulf War. And I went down to Fort Bragg where we were preparing to go overseas. Fortunately, we were not deployed 
Uh, but that was a very serious situation. And I served with uh, predominantly Green Berets in my unit. Um, I received a National Defense Medal and an Army Achievement Medal for my service uh, in the 20th Special Forces Group in the U.S. Army Green Berets, albeit I was not Special Forces qualified. Um, claims that I did not serve in the unit while having the paperwork that I did, uh, claims that I have apologized for lying about my service, I certainly did not. What I did acknowledge is that I was unaware of the uniform change, and the uniform change changes terminology. And if there was any confusion based on using old ter terminology, I wanted to clarify that I was not SF qualified, not what we call a Green Beret, but I did serve in, in the unit. So I'm not um, trying to create impressions that are not true, but I'm not um, uh, allowing anyone to uh, malign my military service. And having paperwork um, that clearly shows my service and then telling the public that I did not serve in those units uh, is completely wrong. Thank you. We'll share these papers. After that interview, David O. told me that I could not take a photo of one of the documents that he had handed me. The offer to share that is still open. I was able to take a photo of the other document and he shared a letter from the Special Forces Association. We put both of those documents on our website and you can also find more battleground politics there. Just go to NBC10.com slash battleground politics or you can find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thank <laughs> you.